chatting with each other, or maybe the coffee hasn't kicked in. But I've now said good morning twice, and one person has answered me, I think. So let's try this again. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Just want to make sure we're awake, because we have a big, full day ahead of us here, and, uh, and we want to start on a high energy level if we can, and keep that sustained through the entire day. Uh, my name is Tim Turnham. I'm the executive director of the Melanoma Research Foundation. Uh, my job is to say a couple of words of welcome and to do it as quickly as possible. But I warn you that I was born and raised in the South and I can't even say hello in less than two hours. So <clears throat> I may break Sarah's rules on this. We'll try. Um, I've decided that I love uh, this part of the country and I particularly love this room. And the reason I love this room is that one of the gentlemen who is serving the food stopped me and said, did anyone ever tell you you look like James Bond? And absolutely not. I think, you know, people with vision issues may not be just the attendees here, but maybe some of the people serving the food can't see as well as they think. He said I look like Sean Connery. I said, I wish I had Sean Connery's accent, better looks, and money. Not necessarily in that order. Um, so I love being here. This is great. Uh, I think uh, I just want to say thank you so much for coming here and, and for being part of this. Uh, some of you have been part of this meeting from the beginning. For some of you, this is your very first time. Um, I will tell you if this is your first time, uh, you are in the presence of some of the most amazing people in the world. Uh, warm, generous, <coughs> courageous, um, passionate, and, and you are now among family. Uh, this is like finding your long lost cousin and realizing there's a bond there that you didn't even know existed. And I hope that that will play out over the next day or two. I encourage you to fully engage in this meeting. Uh, I encourage you also to pace yourself. And that advice may be contradictory. But the fact is, we're dealing with big, heady stuff here. And sometimes it gets hard. And if it gets hard, find a friend, walk away, walk away on your own. And just take a break and then come back and re-engage. This is for you. And if it's helpful and useful, if it challenges you, encourages you, comforts you, educates you, then engage in it. And if it doesn't, step away. Um, this is for you. And then let us know what works and what doesn't work because we want to make this different and better every year. A couple of words about the MRF. Um, we were founded by a person who had cutaneous melanoma, stage four, uh, and was told by her treatment team that virtually nothing could be done to help her. And she said, that's not acceptable, and we want to make a difference. So she pulled together everyone she knew in the, in the melanoma community and said, let's raise money for research. But it wasn't just for research. Uh, I've been digging into the, the early documents, and, and what she actually said was, we want to fund research for patients. We want to make a better reality for patients through research. So research was not the end, but the means to the end. And that dynamic has flavored who we are. Uh, we are now entering our 20th year. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. And through the course of that time, we have funded peer-reviewed, cutting-edge research. We provided scientific leadership, but we also have provided support, information, and education for patients. We've worked on advocacy. We've helped raise awareness. We've worked across the full spectrum of melanoma. And I think that keeps us well informed. We know that research is not an intellectual exercise. This is about making better treatment options for people so people who are diagnosed with melanoma in its many different forms can live longer and better. And, and it's an eclectic group. I, I was struck recently. Um, I was with a, a group of people who are engaged with our organization, and we had opportunities to, to visit at various times in smaller settings, and we started talking about politics. And I, I talked with this one person who's a stage four survivor, a uh, really, really smart person, um, and, and very engaged, and just a great human being. And, and they were saying, if that Donald Trump becomes president, I'm going to leave the country, right? And so then, then a couple of hours later, I'm talking with another stage four person, really smart, 
really helpful to a lot of patients and things like that. And he, and he said, I think Donald Trump's the only one who can really turn things around. And if Hillary Clinton gets elected president, I'm going to leave the country. <laughs> And I thought, you know, it, we are a big sloppy mess here in this country, um, and, and, and we're all over the place, but we find ways to coalesce around things. And some of those things are really kind of trivial. American Idol, really? I'm sorry. I, I mean, I know some of you may be passionate about this. I don't get it, right? And, and, and sometimes, you know, we, we, we coalesce around things that are, that are seemingly trivial, and sometimes we coalesce around things that are really important like cancer. And, and when we coalesce around things that are important, all the other stuff, you know, whether, whether you're a University of Florida or Florida State fan, whether you're a Georgia Tech or a Georgia fan, and, or whether, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, or rich or poor, or from the South or the North or East or the West, that becomes irrelevant because we're focused on something that's more important that binds us together. And, and that's part of the beauty and the wonder of, of things like this. Um, I'm past my time, uh, but I, which I knew would happen. But uh, I'll say, I just want to say a couple other things, and that is, um, in, in, the, in cancer, um, I've seen this in several different kinds of cancer, and I've been involved with cancer patients for, uh, all, in various different ways for many, many, many years. Um, in cancer, you work and you work and you work, and it seems as though no progress is being made. It's just so incremental, and, and sometimes it doesn't even seem incremental. But all of that work pays off because you're learning things as you go along, and you're building a foundation. And then all of a sudden, things begin to break loose, and you see, you can see tremendous changes in relatively short periods of time. We've seen this in dealing with cutaneous melanoma. Uh, for, for, we had never had, until four years ago, we had never had a single drug approved by the FDA that had demonstrated in clinical trials that it made people live longer. Never. Um, and and there had been 13 year gap between anything being approved for cutaneous melanoma un until about four and a half years ago. And since then, we have 12 new treatment regimens comprised of about eight new drugs that have been proved, improved, uh, approved in cutaneous melanoma. And many people feel that at least half of people with metastatic disease and cutaneous melanoma will either be cured or be able to have long-term uh, stable disease. That's unbelievable progress in literally, the, I mean, just almost no time at all. And, and we benefited from some of this progress, not because people cared about melanoma, but because the drug companies thought that some of these drugs would have a broader application. So there's a class of drugs that's been approved, and some of you have heard about these, that are called um, anti-PD-1 drugs. There are, there are two of them on, uh, that have been approved so far. It took a ton of money to get these drugs approved. And the reason the companies worked in melanoma is because it was, they, there was reason to, to feel that they would be particularly effective here and they could get them approved and tested quickly. But the real reason they were interested in these drugs is because they're going to be useful, they are useful in lung cancer, kidney cancer, uh, and probably up to a dozen other kinds of cancer. And so we benefited from this interest in a drug that could help the broader community. And the same thing now is spilling over into ocular melanoma because the studies that were done in cutaneous melanoma with these immunotherapy drugs are now being replicated in the ocular melanoma space. And you'll hear more about that later. Um, and and, and if, if, so it all gets kind of tied together. And I am convinced, and, and listening to the researchers and the scientists who are the experts in the ocular melanoma field, I, I believe that we really are in this age of progress in diagnosing ocular melanoma earlier um, and in having better treatment options for uh, those patients who experience metastatic disease. I don't know that we've made as much progress in the in-between space, and that is understanding what leads from primary tumor to metastatic disease and blocking that. 
So there are gaps still we need to address. You all know that very well. But things are changing, and, and they're changing quickly. And it may not always feel that way, but I promise you there's a level of excitement in the scientific and research community uh, that's palpable uh, and is real and is based on data and not just wishful thinking. So we're living in a hopeful time. Uh, and with that note, I'll now quit talking and turn it over to Sarah.